uh, some tours of our aquarium here, checking out different animals and things like that. Um, so why don't we head on in? Follow me. After you, come on in. <laughs> All right, come on in, guys. All right, we've made it. So, for those of you who haven't been here before, this is Save the Bay's Exploration Center and Aquarium. Uh, this place is a whole lot of fun, and I'd love to just tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Uh, so here at Save the Bay, we work to protect and improve Narragansett Bay. That's the name of our bay. And you know, we do that in a few different ways. We do it through policy work, so making sure there's good laws to help protect the bay. We do that through habitat restoration, so going into different habitats that have been altered by people in different ways, making them healthy for animals and wildlife going into the future. Another thing we do is education. So we teach all about Narragansett Bay and the surrounding watershed to people all over Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, who knows where you guys are right now. Um, and just we want to teach people how wonderful it is and what we can do to help protect and improve it. Um, so I've been talking about our bay here. First thing I'd like to do is actually show you something right here. And for those of you joining us again, my name is Adam Kowarski. I'm Save the Bay's Aquarist. Uh, and I take care of all the life here. So right here, what we're taking a look at is a chart of Narragansett Bay. Um, and if you've seen any of our posts earlier, they did a little lesson on this chart and about what a bay is and why it's important. Um, all I really wanted to do today is just kind of show you where we are. So if you take a look right here, I don't know if you can see it, I got a pretty little penguin right there. Uh, and we are just right in this tiny little strip of land called Easton's Beach. We're right at the southern end of this island right here called Aquidneck Island, largest island in the bay. Uh, another name for this island is Rhode Island. And I don't know if you knew this, but the rest of the land is called Providence Plantation. So Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, that's the name of our state. Uh, and this is the island that the state's named after. Um, all right, so I think we're good on the chart here. So as we do these different live streams, we're gonna try and do a lot of different fun things here. Um, one cool thing we have going on here is a few hundred animals live in our aquarium. Fun fact, every single one of them is from Narragansett Bay, so we get them just in Rhode Island waters. Um, and we kind of get them in a few different ways. We try to be really sustainable here. We want to show people uh, a responsible way to have an aquarium. So all of our anim animals are either in our nursery program, uh, so these animals we get young and small uh, when they're juveniles in the bay, grown for about a year and then release them all right back into the bay, hopefully bigger and stronger, more fit for survival. Um, another way we get our animals is we actually have a lot of rescues here. So a lot of animals that just wouldn't be alive without us, um, victims to illegal poaching, different injuries, um, tropical strays that have been displaced in storms, things like that. Um, and then the rest of our animals are things that we actually breed, like our sharks, our skates, and then we actually release them all right back out into the bay uh, which is just a wonderful thing. We love getting more animals back out there. Um, so I'm thinking the first thing we should do is check out one of our more popular exhibits here. Um, so I'm going to walk around here. You guys can come step up here with me. So Adam, we already have a question. We have questions. I'm ready. Yes. So this one's a little interesting one. It's from sure. Joshua. Sure. Um, he said, if I can feed fish to my dog, can I feed fish to my dog? That's a really interesting question, Joshua. Uh, you know, fish is great for your dogs. Anytime you're going to be eating anything from the ocean or the bay or the water, you want to make sure you're doing responsible things by eating sustainable animals that there's healthy populations of following rec regulations like that as well. I'm also not going to recommend feeding any random fish you find to your dog. Check with your vet. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Good question. Okay, guys. So 
The first thing I'm gonna do is talk about some of the animals uh, that live in a rocky shore habitat. Uh, right now, you're taking a look at many different things that might be found in a Rhode Island tide pool. A tide pool is like a little area of water that's been trapped at low tide. When the tide is high, a bunch of water comes up on the shore, and when it leaves and retreats, there'll be little pools of water left behind, and a lot of time, animals will get stranded in these pools. And many of these animals have learned to adapt and survive to these harsh conditions. In this tank, you can see a whole bunch of life that has learned to adapt and survive in these conditions. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on some of the coolest animals that live in these habitats. Uh, so we're gonna be taking a look at something called an echinoderm. Now, an echinoderm is a type of animal, it's an invertebrate. It means it has no backbone. Uh, so if you wanna know about your backbone, take a couple fingers, just feel on the back of your neck there, you got a big old bump on the back of your spine. That's your backbone. Everything that's an invertebrate does not have one of these. They don't need it. They have other adaptations for survival, all right? So everything that's an echinoderm, they have spiny skin. So echino means spiny and derm means skin, kind of like the dermatologist, you know, you go there to get your skin checked out. Um, so all these echinoderms have spiny skin in different ways. Um, and we're going to be taking a look at two different echinoderms. So we have sea stars and purple sea urchins we're going to be focusing on today. All right, so why don't we take a look here and I'll grab some out and we're gonna start learning about them. So Adam, before you get too far into that, um, we have a question from Reagan here. It says, where are the best tide pools in Rhode Island? Oh geez, well, my favorite tide pools are at Beaver Tail Lighthouse. Um, right around that, Beaver Tail is a Department of Environmental Management State Park uh, and it's beautiful. Great hiking there wonderful tide pools. If you go there though, it can be pretty big waves, so you want to be careful checking it out. Uh, but it's just, it's a wonderful location, a great place to really uh, take your time and do that. Fort Weatherall is another good one. These are both in Jamestown. Excellent. All right, you guys ready to check out some echinoderms? I think so. So the first one we're going to focus on here is the purple sea urchin. So I'm going to take a couple out here, and I just want to take a minute to observe them. Now these animals, some of you might be concerned, he's taking them out of the water, don't they breathe underwater? Well, yes, they do breathe underwater. But these animals can live up to about six hours out of the water depending on conditions. The reason why they live in tide pools and it's common to get stranded out of the water. So these guys can really handle being out of the water for quite a long time. Another question I get a lot about these guys is, are they alive? They're absolutely alive and they move and breathe and everything, uh, they just move extremely slow. Most echinoderms, uh, their full speed moving is about six feet an hour, so that, that's pretty darn slow. Um, other people from other parts of the world a lot of times ask me, aren't they poisonous? Is it a good idea to handle these? Uh, and the nice thing is about Rhode Island, there's not a lot of poisonous things in the bay, a few things, but not much. Um, and our species of echinoderm have not developed these novel weapons uh, with poisons that many other urchins around the world have had. Oh, this is crawling off my hand. <laughs> Get him in the other one. So these guys, they really just don't need those poisonous spines. Um, part of it is they're really well camouflaged. These guys live around seaweed near the top of the shoreline. And uh, the reason why they live near seaweed is because that's actually what they eat. Uh, so it's a good idea to camouflage with that. So there's not a lot of things that really make a living off of eating sea urchins in Rhode Island. Uh, we have a question from Susie. Great. What makes the sea urchins a purple color? A lot of it has to do with diet. So depending on what these guys are eating, uh, they can actually change color a little bit. So let me show you here. Some of the ones down here are a little lighter, lighter purple. And these ones might be eating different species of seaweed and it'll give them slightly different colors. But overall, the purple ones in Rhode Island is just their genetic makeup, just like people are different colors and different colors of hair. Urchins can have different colors too. Good question, Susie. All right, guys, so these purple sea urchins are believed to be completely blind. They can't see at all, so that means they have a bunch of other senses they use to move around and get around and find what they need. Uh, so they have an amazing sense of uh, kind of like smell. They can taste and smell the water and sense where their food is uh, and it helps them eat and, and function. Uh, and 
a really cool thing. I'm gonna flip these guys over now so you guys can see the other side of them. Are right, you ready? Wow, so some of these guys are actually eating right now. Didn't even notice. So you can see this one right here and this one right here. And you know what? They're not eating seaweed. And this is one thing I forgot to mention. Most echinoderms around the planet are primarily herbivorous. Herbivorous means they eat mostly plants, seaweed. Uh, the ones in Rhode Island are actually slightly omnivorous, kind of like people, right? We eat plants, we eat meat, things like that. Uh, these guys will eat a lot of plant matter, but they'll also supplement sometimes uh, with different types of animal matter. So right now they're eating a couple pieces of fish that was meant for some of the other animals, uh, but we always throw in a little bit extra so these guys can eat. Now if you look really close here, the purple one, he's really moving, this one right here. You guys see that? It's amazing. And then on this one right here, he's not eating right now, but you can get a really good view of his mouth and his teeth. I don't know, if is that coming through on your feed? Excellent, it's coming through. So you can see his teeth right there. He has five self-sharpening teeth that grow with him his entire life, kind of like a beaver's teeth, uh, and they get worn down as they eat their food. These teeth are arranged in a radial pattern. What that means is they're arranged in a circular pattern, kind of like my fingers are right now. It opens, comes out, grabs his food, pulls it back in. It's really amazing, right on the bottom there. Beautiful, and Adam, we do have one more question. Sure. Um, Jessica wants to know if it, our sea urchins have faces. Sea urchins, uh, you know what, it, it's a really interesting thing. A lot of times people think of different animals and try and relate them to people or maybe other animals that they see a lot. And some of them are just so wildly different, it's hard to really compare them. Um, most of the time when I think of a face, I think of something that has eyes, a mouth, a nose, ears, things like that. They don't really have a lot of these things. Uh, they have a, a mouth right there. They are covered in spines around their entire body, which they can wiggle. Uh, and then they also have something called tube feet, which again, those are covered around their entire body. Uh, and for those of you that don't know what tube feet are, they're basically like little suction cups that they can use to move around. Wow, you can see these guys are really, really moving. Um, so I would say since they just, just started moving a lot more, this signals to me time to put them back in. So let's put them back in. I'm gonna go right back up here. Um, we do have a question from Juliet. Sure. She wants to know how many sea stars you think there might be in the bay. That's a really good question. Uh, and you know what? I have no idea. That's a great thing we can look up. Uh, there's different organizations that do different types of surveys throughout Rhode Island to try and figure out how many types of life are in there. Um, so I'd recommend looking through different scholarly articles to get an answer to a question like that. That being said, uh, any sea stars that you're gonna find in Rhode Island are gonna be on rocky shorelines like this, uh, or they might be in deeper water on rocky bottom surfaces as well. Um, in a single tide pool, you can find anywhere from none, because some, you know, it's, it's fishing, you don't always get stuff, but I found, you know, maybe up to 10 in a tide pool before. Excellent. All right, guys, so if everyone's still having fun here, I think we can move on to another animal. Let's talk about our sea stars a little more. So taking a look down here, we actually have two different species of sea star. So yeah, we can take a look at this one right here. So this one right here is called a Forbes sea star, all right? They have the five arms, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. And we have another species in this tank over here as well. We're gonna move over this way. And this one right here is actually a polar sea star, all right? And if we count, we have one, two, three, four, five, six arms on this one. So this one has one more arm. It's a good way to identify it. The tricky part is too, sometimes the Forbes sea stars will be found with six arms instead of five. It's pretty rare, but it does happen sometimes. So it took us a while to figure out that this was a different species. We had to read a lot of books uh, and really take a close look at its ex external anatomy to figure that one out. Um, all right, so this sea star to me looks like he's eating. This star over here also looks like he's eating. I'm gonna avoid those two for the moment. And I'm gonna pick up this one right here because it doesn't look like he's really eating. So Adam, while we're talking about these sea stars, sure. Janine wants to know how many sea stars we have in our aquarium. In our aquarium, we pro so we have uh, four different species of sea stars in our aquarium. 
and I would estimate we probably have about 30 of them right now. I have to go do a recount because we actually just got all of our animals from our headquarters brought down here a couple days ago so they could have a good home uh, while they're in quarantine with all of us, right? Um, so they're all hanging out here and we're taking good care of them. That's great, I, I can count later and let everyone know for sure. All right, excellent. So taking a look at the sea star, it's actually formed to my hand just in the few moments that I've been holding it. Uh, one of the questions I get usually first about sea stars, what's that orange dot right there? I get that a lot. That orange dot there, super cool adaptation that this guy has. It's called a madreporite, or a mother pore is another name for it. So the mother pore, it's a really interesting organ. So what it does, it moves liquids in and out of the body. That way it can breathe, uh, but it also controls all of the movement in the sea star. Really unique. Sea stars have no muscles at all. All of their movement is controlled through water pressure. So you can see this guy is starting to move around my hand. Uh, wow, super interesting. It feels really weird. He's sticking onto my fingers right now. Interesting sensation. I, you know, I've been doing this, gosh, 15 years or so, and it, it's still, this stuff is amazing for me. I really love it. So he's crawling around my hand right now. Hopefully he's not trying to eat me. Um, which, you know, not an actual danger, uh, but an interesting thing. So sea stars here, they love to eat something uh, called a bivalve. So that, that's pretty much anything that lives in two shells. Great examples of those are gonna be things like clams, uh, mussels, quahogs, if you are from Rhode Island, you, you all know what a quahog is. Uh, surf clams, oysters, scallops, all of those types of things, all right? So if we take a look in here, we have a couple examples of those. So this right here is an oyster. I'm gonna set him down for a minute while we're talking about the oyster. So this is an oyster, it's a type of bivalve, all right? And you can see, if we open it up, there's no one in there anymore. Oh, there's a mussel living in there. We'll move him. <clears throat> so this bivalve, this oyster here, there's, he's not alive anymore. He's been eaten by most likely a sea star in this tank here. And I don't know about you guys. I don't know if you've ever tried to open up a mussel by hand. It's not going to happen. You can't do it. You don't have enough strength in just your fingers. Uh, you need tools hammer, an oyster shucker, things like that. But a sea star can open it right up. They have no problem doing this. So let's take a look at him again, and I'm gonna try and describe how a sea star opens up a sea star, a, uh, an oyster. So if we take a look underneath here, you can see, I don't know if you can see all those little dots on there along the legs. They might start moving. Yeah, they're starting to move on the tips there. Those are all those tube feet. And you might remember me talking about tube feet because the sea urchins have the tube feet as well. All these little tube feet are what they used to move around with those suction cups once again. So they move around, they find something like an oyster, and what they'll do is they'll actually wrap right around it, just like that. And as they wrap around it, they start to pull. And you can see he's actually kind of doing it right now, which is really neat. So they start to pull and pull and pull, and they pull and pull and pull, and eventually they can get it open, which is really interesting. How is a sea star that strong? Well, here's the deal. An oyster has a muscle inside of it called an abductor muscle. We've talked about this before on our podcast yesterday, our, uh, our live stream yesterday. Uh, so they pull and pull and pull on that abductor muscle. So trying to open it up like that, right? And eventually, what happens with muscles when, when they get tired? Well, your muscles, they get tired, you know, when you use them too much and they wear out and you can't really use them anymore. So what'll happen is that muscle wears out, it gets tired, and eventually the oyster gives up and it opens right up. And then you might think, well, doesn't the sea star get tired? The sea star doesn't get tired. It can pull indefinitely. The reason why, it has no muscles at all. All of its movement is controlled by that water pressure. So it can pull and pull and pull until that oyster's open. Once these, the oyster's open, it'll maybe have it open eh, just a crack, kind of like that. And then right underneath the sea star is where its mouth is. The mouth is right in the middle there. So it'll line up that mouth with the crack that it's just made. It'll actually spit its stomach out of its mouth. It goes into the oyster. It digests it inside the shell and then slurps it back up like a nice clam smoothie or oyster smoothie and it loves it. It can eat tons of these, uh, which is just a really amazing thing about our sea stars here. A uh, couple other fun facts about sea stars. If they ever lose an arm, it'll actually regrow back. Look 
can regenerate. How cool would that be if we could regenerate our body parts? Sea stars can do this no problem. Researchers look at this all the time, trying to figure out how we can make it happen for people. Really, really interesting thing here. All right, so another fun question I get all the time about sea stars, can they see? Well, you remember the sea urchin itself there, it was blind, right? Sea stars actually can see, which I think is an amazing thing. And if we take a look back down here at the sea star, I can show you where their eyes are. Um, now they're microscopic, meaning you're not gonna be able to see it right now, but they have one eye on the tip of each of their five arms. So they have five eyes, if they have five legs, or like our polar star over here, who's got six legs, right? He's gonna have six eyes, one on the tip of each of those huge arms, which is really neat. Now these eyes are a little bit different than our eyes. They don't really see like us. They're more like light sensors, so they kind of, you know, can see shadows and things like that. So here's an activity you can try at home if you're interested. Uh, if you want to learn how to see like a sea star. So once you guys watch me do it first, then you can give it a shot. So find a light. Not too bright, right? You don't want to hurt yourself, but find a light. Look up at the light. You can close your eyes and then really slowly wave your hand over your eyes, right? If you do that, hopefully you're seeing a shadow. And that's gonna be really similar how, to how a sea star sees with his little eye spots on there. Excellent, and I could go on and on and on about all of this stuff, but I wanna save some more for next time. Beautiful, Adam, we do have a couple questions Excellent. left. Um, so Hannah asked, when do these guys generally return to the tide pools? I was at Colton, Colton State Park the other week, and the only things I were able to find were snails, no crabs. About when in the year will crabs, fish, and other creatures start returning to the tide pools? Excellent. So, um, one thing to keep in mind, all of these animals that I've talked about so far spend their entire lives in Narragansett Bay. So, so they're always around. Um, they move to different areas uh, as they see fit, maybe different times of the year, kind of like you're saying. Uh, that being said, too, you're not always going to find all this stuff in a different tide pool. Uh, you have to get lucky to find a lot of these things, and, you, and sometimes you need just like a ton of, ex of practice to, to find it. you got to flip over lock, rocks, look at different areas. And if you're going to do this stuff, which I highly recommend, I recommend people going out and find their favorite areas, looking for these animals, learning about them, but then leaving them in nature. The only reason we have them is because you know we have special permits and we want to teach about them and do all our restoration work with them as well. Um, so that being said, in the warmer months, a lot of times you're going to find a lot more of this stuff. Things become more active when the water becomes warmer. They're going to be looking for more food to eat because they have a higher biological need as well. So these are times you might find more of them. One thing we've noticed over the years, a lot of sea stars and, uh, have been actually migrating into deeper and deeper waters, further away from land. No one really knows exactly why that's happening or, or why we're only finding them in these deeper areas. Um, but there's research being done on that um, all over the, the world, actually, to try and figure out why sea stars um, are being found in kind of different places and, and less along the shoreline. Good question. Um, another question about the sea urchins from Sarah. She wants to know how they self-sharpen their Aristotle's lantern. Yeah, so pretty. it's just such a cool thing. So the Aristotle's lantern, they call it a lantern because it has sort of a lantern shape like that. It's kind of like an oval with all the little points right there. So what happens is those teeth, grow and extend their entire life, all right? They're always, always growing. And what they do is as they grow, they're, they need to actually use them, otherwise they'll, they'll get too long. I've found uh, sea urchins before with really long teeth. It kind of gets hard for them to function. So what they'll do is they scrape algae off the rocks, all right? And if you look down here, you can actually see all this red stuff that's kind of on there. That's a, a really fine type of algae growing on the rocks here, all right? And what they do is they scrape it off the rocks and they'll eat it. And as they do that, it'll actually sharpen their teeth on the rocks. Just like people can sharpen, you know, cooking knives on stones and things like that, these guys are gonna sharpen their teeth right on the rocky, beautiful rocky shorelines here in Rhode Island. Beautiful. So I think we answered as many questions as we can. Um, actually, we have one last question. Um, can sea stars breathe out of water? That's great. I'm, I'm glad you guys brought that up. I, I meant to mention that. So the sea stars cannot breathe out of water, but 
because they have such low metabolic needs for oxygen, they can last out of the long water for a very long time. So as long as they're moist, depending on outdoor conditions, things like that, uh, that they, they actually on average can last out of the water a good six hours in between tidal cycles. That's about how long it takes for the tides to kind of come back in and then hopefully wash them back into shore. Um, so that, that should work pretty good for them. Beautiful. And I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, but if we didn't get to answer any of your questions, we can for sure in the comments below. Excellent. That's wonderful. So if you guys all enjoyed our live stream today and you feel like you want to support Save the Bay's ongoing efforts, uh, there's a link somewhere on this page here where you can actually click it and donate to help support all these beautiful animals that we have here and the, and the great work that we do. Uh, thank you so much and we'll see you again tomorrow.